the Locked On Blue Jay podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today, Wednesday's episode of this week, we get set for tonight's pitching matchup, pair of veteran righties doing battle, Jose Barrios versus Lance Lynn. And as yesterday was game number 86 for the 2023 Toronto Blue Jays, I thought, hey, you know what? Gives us an opportunity. Game number 86. Let's take a look at what happened to this franchise in 1986. The 1986 Toronto Blue Jays epic season. Talking things from uniform burning. Yeah, you heard that correctly. Uniform burning. Uh, the American League All-Star team was almost, that that outfield was almost all Toronto Blue Jays. There was an important trade in there and numerous franchise records from the 1986 Toronto Blue Jays. I'm excited to get into that with you. Let's get into today's episode. You are Locked On Blue Jays, your daily Toronto Blue Jays podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends. Craig Ballard, Locked On Blue Jays. He has indeed been locked on the Toronto Blue Jays ever since I can remember. First year actually hosting this show, the Locked On Blue Jay podcast, been around for a while. I'm, I'm blessed to be uh, to have taken it over this year. Absolutely want to thank you for choosing to spend part of your day talking Toronto Blue Jay baseball with me. Toronto Blue Jay baseball is a big deal for me and my family, perhaps for you as well. That's That's how we're connected, right? So I see you and I appreciate that about you. I want to remind you that all Blue Jay games this season available on SiriusXM. And if you're taking this in on the... Locked on Blue Jay podcast YouTube channel. Want to say thank you for that. Please hit that like, leave that comment. Please hit that subscribe. Really want to shout out uh, some some comments that I've really been enjoying lately. Uh, Yada, 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 19, a dulcimerist, Dante Wechter. Dante, I'm thinking it's Wechter for the last name. I I hope I'm right on that because I appreciate you leaving the comments there. Dub Nugs. uh, Dub Nugs likes the new setup. Thanks, Dub. Appreciate you on that. Uh, New Brunswick, Canada guy, 6476, and Leah Herring, 6916. Leah, I hope I've got that name right as well, because I appreciate you dropping that comment. And to the everydayers, making the Locked On Blue Jay podcast your first podcast listen every day on Apple or wherever you you take in your podcast. Thank you for that. Um, I don't know how all the other ones work, but I know for Apple, you can leave that five-star rating. So please, uh, please uh, do (laughs) leave that five-star rating. Now, Jose Barrios has struggled on the mound, on on this mound, where they are in Chicago at Guaranteed Rate Field. I say it every time I say Guaranteed Rate Field, I feel like I just have to mention, is that the worst? Well, no, because there are some really bad ones, right, with sponsorship going on these days. But that's one of the worst names for a ballpark, Guaranteed Rate Field. Okay. Now, Barrios has struggled on the mound at Guaranteed Rate Field in the past. But even with that said, I do like the pitching matchup. I do think it favors the Toronto Blue Jays tonight. Let's take a look. Jose Barrios on the mound for your Toronto Blue Jays. Now, truth be told, I mean, the eye test and the numbers do back this up. I mean, we've got to love what we've seen on the whole from Jose Barrios, certainly in 2023, but been nowhere near as sharp on the road as he has been at the Rogers Center. And remember now, Barrios was a longtime Minnesota twin pitching in the American League Central where the Chicago White Sox live. And remember the unbalanced schedule that we had for for absolutely (laughs) ages in baseball so Barrios has faced this White Sox team many times and he's pitched on this mound in this ballpark many times guaranteed rate field I know and uh, just the worst name worst name for a ballpark but anyway Barrios lots of experience here has rarely gone well for him in this ballpark I'll say that four and four career record ERA is over five in Chicago at guaranteed rate field. Now, he did pitch at this ballpark last season as a member of the Toronto Blue Jays, and these struggles were on display. Uh, he, uh, he lasted just four innings, six runs on nine hits, three home runs. Four innings? Six runs on nine hits, three home runs? Actually is the second start in a row uh, in this ballpark. Where he where he did allow three home runs, at least three home runs. So certainly going to have to keep an eye on that tonight. He's dominated Luis Robert Jr. and Yasmani Grandel, a couple of uh, you know main pieces of this White Sox lineup. They're combined just four for twenty nine against Jose Barrios in his career. That's a one thirty eight batting average. That's complete domination. That's the rest of the White Sox that have given Jose Barrios the the issues. The the rest of the shy Sox they combine forty four for one hundred and thirty four. That's a three twenty eight batting average. So we'll look for that continued domination tonight against Robert Jr. and and Yasmani Grandal. But my goodness, Jose Barrios absolutely needs to step it up (laughs) against the rest of this White Sox lineup as well. 
Uh, Barrios on the season, he's been similar to Bassett in that lefties are hitting him really well, but he's dominating righties. And this White Sox team just doesn't have, I mean, Sheets, Benintendi, the, there's just not a whole lot of lefties that you're going to be concerned with in this White Sox lineup. So again, I, I think even though Barrios has struggled against this team, has struggled on this mound in the past, uh, I do think that 2023 Barrios is pitching well enough that we can be we can be optimistic about the start tonight. Uh, we know his fastball location has been night and day this season to where it was last season and not missing, you know, center right down the middle of the plate. His, he runs his fastball up there at 95, 96. So you'd think he has some leeway of missing his spots, but not when it's not when he was missing right down the middle, left, right, and center last season. Oh, I shouldn't say or not when he was missing right down the middle, you know, over and over again last season. Major league hitters, they're on the major league level because they can deal with 95, 96. If it's right down the middle, it's going to get dealt with on the big league level. So Barrios this season has been living uh, on the edges, on the corners, significantly better, been been on the top and the bottom of the strike zone, significantly better. And the slurve continues to be just an outstanding pitch for him. It, it was a great pitch last season. Even though Barrios led the, the league, he had the worst ERA last season. We know the, the disappointments that we had with Barrios in 2022, but even then, his slurve was still very good. It was the fastball. It was the sinker. It was the other pitches that just were not effective at all. So it wasn't giving the slurve a chance to, to get set up to be effective as well. Fellow righty Lance Lynn on the mound, the, the big fellow, five and eight with a 6.47 ERA for the Chicago White Sox. Now, Barrios, remember, he led the league with the worst ERA last season, while Lance Lynn at 6.47, he's got the second worst ERA this season behind only Jordan Lyles. And I don't know if you've seen what Jordan Lyles is, what, what sort of season he's putting together out there in Kansas City, but he just won his last start about a week ago. They finally won their first game. I think they'd lost his first, like, 15, 16 starts, whatever it was, and and, and he himself is 1-11. So Jordan Lyles in 2023, not the pitcher you want to be keeping company with but unfortunately for the Chicago White Sox that's the that, that's the sort of production that's I've got to put that in quotes right production that Lance Lynn has been giving them so far in 2023 now I will say that Lynn has been better lately and the White Sox have played better with him on the mound lately I mean they've won six of Lynn's last nine starts and that includes winning three of his last four home starts now, he is coming off a start where he got the win, but he did allow three home runs. Now, Lance Lynn is a fly ball pitcher, and he's already allowed 22 home runs this season. That's already almost at his career worst. The, the most home runs he's allowed in a season, I believe, is 27. He's already at 22, and those 22, by the way, Worse than all of baseball. No pitcher has allowed more home runs than Lance Lynn. Number two is Yusei Kikuchi at 21. So let's hope that, that you know, as we walk into this uh, trip, as we walk into this Wednesday night game, it's Lynn leading the majors in home runs because it's Kikuchi pitching for the Blue Jays tomorrow, right? So let's hope they don't they don't flip-flop spots, of course. Now, one thing that Lance Lynn continues to be in, in the positive for him, he continues to be a strikeout machine, but boy, oh boy, everything around that, everything outside of that, I should say, has just been completely unrecognizable for Lance Lynn. I'm sure the White Sox thought at some point he would be a really good trade candidate. They'd get, get some good assets to, to replenish uh, the the rebuilder. Or, I mean, White Sox fans will tell you, who knows if we're in a rebuild or a reload. They're, they're not really sure the direction of the team, but I'm sure Lance Lynn would have been been seen as a great trade option. Boy, I, I, I don't know if that's the case anymore. He's on pace this season for a career worst in whip. It's currently at 1.50, which is the third worst in all of baseball. Opponents are hitting 277 this season versus Lance Lynn. That's by far his career worst. And for all of this, you know, again, back to the quotes, production that the White Sox are getting, Lynn's making just a titch under 20 million US dollars. So that's like what, 3.2 billion Canadian or, or whatever that works out to. Okay, anyway, but he's making a, a lot of money and the production just has not been there. And, and he's been an, an equal opportunity uh, uh, offender as far as the White Sox are concerned. I mean, righties and lefties both hitting Lynn. Righties and lefties are both smashing Lynn's four-seamer. Uh, his cutter has been hit. His sinker is getting hit. Lefties are killing Lance Lynn's changeup. Lefties are hitting over 500 against Lance Lynn's, Lance Lynn's changeup. Over 500 against one pitch. That's absolutely incredible. Now, in the lineup tonight, the one and the nine hitters for the Blue Jays, Springer and Kiermaier, they've done well against Lance Lynn. So they've done really well in their career. 11 for 33. That's a 333 batting average combined for those two. Belt, seven for 18 for Brandon Belt. Now, all seven hits were singles. So kind of take that a little bit with a grain of salt, I guess. But the rest of this Blue Jays lineup, as much as Lynn is struggling this season, and, and as much as they hit him earlier this season as well, Lynn pitched in that April series. Jays got to him, absolutely. But even with that said, from a career standpoint, the rest of this Blue Jays batting lineup outside of Kiermaier, Springer, and Belt, 
just 18 for 97. That's a 186 batting average, 31 strikeouts. 18 hits, 31 strikeouts. So in the past, Lance Lynn has done very well against the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, Matt Chapman is an interesting watch tonight. He ha he has just two hits against Lance Lynn in 20 at-bats with nine strikeouts. So two for 20 with nine strikeouts. The two hits were home runs. So, I mean, you're talking about feast or famine. Let, let, let's keep an eye on that matchup <laughs> tonight as well, of course. Now, in that start against the Blue Jays back in April, Lance Lynn threw 102 pitches, lasted five innings, gave up four runs on five hits, three walks. So there's there's that whip, right? Five innings pitched, uh, five hits, three walks, uh, eight base runners over those five innings. We see how that whip is is and that's that's very typical of a Lance Lynn start is why his whip is walks and hits per innings pitch has it, been so bad is third worst in baseball now, if you take your mind's eye back to that game against the Blue Jays the first time through the lineup Lance Lynn I, I was unpleasantly surprised because Lynn did well I knew he was struggling and, and we knew the Jays you know had to had to do well against the Chicago especially at home right I believe it was uh, Lynn, Lynn was the second game of that series and the Jays had taken the first game so of course wanted to win that series so I was very disgruntled the first time through the lineup but the second time through the lineup okay Blue Jay batters made their adjustments and really started to hit Lynn. And typically this season, another reason why I was a little frustrated with the early going, typically this season, Lance Lynn, that's where he's gotten himself in trouble. That's where things have gone off the rail right away is in that first inning. So Springer, Bo, and Vladdy, let's get off to a good start tonight and set the tone. Coming up on the Lockdown Blue Jay podcast, since yesterday was 2023 Toronto Blue Jay game number 86, I thought, you know what, let's deep dive an incredibly memorable 1986 season for the Toronto Blue Jays. Lots, <laughs> lots happening in 1986 for the Toronto Blue Jays. But first, a reminder that tonight's game is available on SiriusXM and wanted to mention that we've got, thrilled to have, a new sponsor, Sleeper. Now about Sleeper. Sleeper is a fantasy sports and real money gaming app focused on bringing people together through sports and gaming. Sleeper has become the fastest organically growing platform in the world while, while earning some of the highest levels of engagement per user in the industry. At Sleeper, it's not just about sports. It's about building personal connections and lasting memories. Pretty cool. Sleeper Picks is a real money product that connects friends over picks. You choose two to eight of your favorite players in pregame, live, across different sports, however you want to do it, and you, then you pick the higher or the lower to the, of the predicted stats. What would the results be of the predicted stats? Only on Sleeper can you get up to 100 time payouts, a share with your friends, and get rewarded together. Use the promo code Locked On, and you'll get up to $100 match to your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. It's currently operational in over 30 states, so check out Sleeper today. You can predict the hottest baseball stats like home runs, hits, strikeouts, I mean, you name it, much more, and cash in on your daily fantasy baseball skills. Again, the promo code to use is Locked On, and Sleeper will match your first deposit up to $100. Entries can be made in 30 seconds or less. Yeah, that easy. Safe and fast withdrawals, so check out Sleeper. The 1986 Toronto Blue Jays. Wow. I know for a lot of you, weren't around in 86, right? Or, or were just barely around. So don't know a lot about the 1986 Toronto Blue Jays. And, you know, normally we do these throwback things on Throwback Thursday. For Throwback Thursday, I'm going to have to bite the bullet. If we're looking at 86 today, I'm going to have to use, have to tell the stories about on, on Throwback Thursday about the 87 Blue Jays since we're doing 86 today. Every day as well, no, we've referenced the 1987 Blue Jays a few times and I've not wanted to deep dive it because it is 87 and I'm still saying it's too soon because would you believe if you don't know already... <laughs> Tune in tomorrow. You will learn that the 1987 Toronto Blue Jays authored one of the great collapses, not in Toronto Blue Jay franchise history, in Major League Baseball history. Yeah, that bad. Well, it was on the heels of the 1986 collapse that was pretty bad as well, but so many interesting things about the 1986 Toronto Blue Jays. First of all, 86, so of course they're on the heels of the drive for 85, which was 1985. That's the first time the Blue Jays ever made the playoffs. And every season in baseball history, the American League Championship Series was best out of five. Win three out of five, you go to the World Series. 1985 was the first season in baseball history where they switched and the American League Championship Series, it went from best of five to best of seven. Well, of course, wouldn't you know it? And I remember even as a youngster seeing this coming a mile away. I knew this is how it was going to turn out, right? With my luck, with our Blue Jay luck, right? Of course, the Blue Jays win three of the first four games. So they're up three games to one. So in any other season in baseball history, prior to 85, Blue Jays would have been in the World Series. But nope, have to win that fourth game in this best of seven. Well, 
Kansas City Royals. That was George Brett, Brett Saberhagen, uh, Dan Quisenberry. You remember him? Six, six sidearm uh, relief pitcher, Dan Quisenberry, the quiz. They would win game five. They would win game six. They would win game seven. Oh, my gosh. And, and eliminate the Toronto Blue Jays. Holy moly. So the 1986 Toronto Blue Jays came in with a massive chip on their shoulders, something to prove. And ironically, and, and you know, for a lot of us in the fan base, upsettingly had a new manager in place. Craig, if 85 Blue Jays made the playoffs for the first time, how, what new manager in 86? Well, Bobby Cox was the longtime manager. And at the end of the 85 season, he left and went and took over that Atlanta Braves job. And yeah, that Bobby Cox, who was the Atlanta Braves manager for what, 20 something years, like he was there for a long, long, long time, extreme amount of success. I see why he went to Atlanta. Yes, indeed. But Blue Jays third base coach, Jimmy Williams would, would take over as the manager. And Jimmy, how, how do you spell Jimmy? Because this guy spells a J-I-M-Y. So right out the gate, we knew this guy is not all there. This guy's not going to be a good manager. And he was not all there. And he was not a good manager. But anyway, the 86 Blue Jays would finish. Now, watch this now. They would finish 86 and 76. Now, you thought I said watch this because 86, 1986 and 86 wins. No, that, that 86 and 76 fourth place finish. That's literally the exact pace as we sit here right here right now that the 2023 Toronto Blue Jays are on, an 86-win team that finishes in fourth place. Now, in these days, of course, there was no Central Division. There's an American League East, American League West, a National League East, a National League West, seven teams in each division, and you won your division or you went home. No wild card going on in, in these days, right, of course. And an, another indication of how, how different things were then, the Toronto Blue Jays had two players. Two that made over a million dollars. Uh, uh, Bill Cottle, relief pitcher, made one point five million, and Dave Steve made just a titch over one million U.S. for the Toronto Blue Jays. I mean, I think the minimum now is like seven hundred twenty thousand U.S. Right? Like holy, mo so times have changed. Yes, indeed. In season, in nineteen eighty six, the Toronto Blue Jays would trade veteran starting pitcher Doyle Alexander. So remember now, in 83 and 84, the Blue Jays are really on the come up. It, it, it culminated in 85 with that first playoff win. But I say really on the up. I mean, here comes Lloyd Mosby. Here comes Jesse Barfield. Here comes George Bell. Domaso Garcia is there. Here comes Tony Fernandez. Here comes Fred McGriff. Here come a lot of studs through, through the Blue Jays system during this time. Well, uh, well, uh, uh, Doyle Alexander was brought in to be that veter veteran presence and, and, and really be that leader. And yeah, that's the way to put it, that veteran presence. He did an outstanding job in that role for the Toronto Blue Jays. Bobby Cox wanted him over in Atlanta in 86 to do the same thing with his up and coming Atlanta Braves. So they pulled that trigger and in exchange for the veteran Doyle Alexander, the Blue Jays would acquire then rookie reliever Dwayne Ward. Okay. Okay. Did things work out for the Blue Jays there with that trade? Okay. Thank you. 1986 Toronto Blue Jays. I mentioned Fred McGriff. 86 was also McGriff's rookie season. Remember, he would spend the first couple seasons with the Blue Jays and then go on to author his Hall of Fame career. We're all so happy for the crime dog, right? My gosh, so easy to cheer for him. Every day as we'll remember this part of 1986 as well, because we did deep dive this in a, in, a, in a throwback Thursday a few weeks back. It was mid-May of 86 when Domaso Garcia, a very frustrated Domaso Garcia, again, the Blue Jays in general were, were super frustrated in 86 because of that bitter taste of how 85 ended. And Domaso Garcia had been an all-star a couple seasons in a row now, and he was really struggling, and, and he had a real passion for the game. So he was very upset. Well, he burned his uniform. Yes, you did hear that correctly. Went into the locker room. At that very same game, George Bell was taking out a lot of frustrations as well. He beat the crap out of a, a chair that was in that was in the dressing room there. So George Bell going the more traditional route of what we've seen when, when we see these sort of outbursts. Damaso Garcia took his uniform in, into the clubhouse. And remember, the Jays started in 77. So these were gorgeous 1986 uniforms. It was the 10-year anniversary. Had a beautiful 10-year anniversary patch. These were awesome jerseys. Domo set it on fire, including the hat, the stirrups. I mean, you name it, got in a lot of trouble, as you can imagine, for that. Now, I mean, ironically, and and for, for you youngsters out there listening, please don't get any ideas here because I'm sure this is coincidental, but Domo would turn his season around after that. He had over 300 the rest of the season, so maybe it worked for Domo. So, but, I mean, is that insane? So already we're at mid-May, and things are already insane for the 1986 Toronto Blue Jays. You can see why I wanted to deep dive this with you here. Now, the 86 Toronto Blue Jays, that's an exhibition stadium, of course. They, they went just 42 and 39 at home. Hmm, hmm. Now, heading into June, the 1986 Toronto Blue Jays are under 500, and they're in last place. And remember, how many teams in the division at that point? Seven. So they're in seventh place out of seven teams. They're 10 games back of the Boston Red Sox going into June in the American League East. Now, the Jays would get hot. 
Uh, no, I don't think it's because of Domingo Garcia's antics, but the Blue Jays would get hot. They would go on a 52 and 34 run, and now they would enter September in second place. Climb that rung, dead last, seventh, six five four three, second place, just three and a half games behind the Boston Red Sox. And this 86 Red Sox team, it, just to set that stage, that's the 24 and four Roger Clemens Cy Young. That that was the year Roger Clemens became Rocket Roger Clemens, and in '86 the the Red Sox would would go on serves them right, right, but. <laughs> because they would go on to lose the World Series. That was the one where they lost to the Mets, Mookie Wilson with that dribbler down to Bill Buckner at first base. All Buckner has to do is field it cleanly, and the Boston Red Sox win the World Series in Game 6. He doesn't field it cleanly. The winning run score for the Mets, and the Mets would take Game 7 as well. You, you, you know that story. Yeah, that was what was going on in 86. So the Blue Jays catch absolute fire. They're knocking on the door. Wouldn't we take right now, the, wouldn't we sign up right now for the Toronto Blue Jays to enter September at three and a half back of the Tampa Bay Rays? We would sign up for that right now. That's striking distance. You're you're in the race. Well, over the last 30 games of the season, the Blue Jays would win just 12. Red Sox would win 19, so they end up burying the Blue Jays. But yeah, an absolute free fall to close the season for the Toronto Blue Jays. Jim Clancy, the veteran righty Jim Clancy, he would make six Blue Jays starts in September and one in October. So down the stretch, Clancy made seven starts for the Blue Jays. Blue Jays lost all seven. Blue Jays lost all seven. Even Dave Steeb. And this was, I mean, I, I say the rookie Fred McGriff. It wasn't Fred McGriff, Fred McGriff yet, right? But when you say Dave Steeb, it was Dave Steeb, Dave Steeb. Steeb uh, was coming off like six at this point, six stellar seasons. Dave Steeb was an absolute star at this point. Blue Jays would lose four of his last six starts as well. The only pitcher who down the stretch didn't just completely fall apart was Jimmy Key. Blue Jays went six and two in the veteran lefty starts. He was the only, only pitcher, even Tom Hankey, even the close. I mean, all of it fell apart for the Blue Jays down the stretch in 1986. A Blue Jays had a, a mid-September. There was a week in mid-September where they won just one game. They went one and six, and that sent them from four and a half games back to nine games back. And now there's just a little over two weeks left in the season. Blue Jays would even finish. They, they would win nine of the last 13 games of the season. They finished on a nine and four run. But my goodness, when, you, when you've dug that hole early in September, nine games back with two and a half weeks left, 13 or sorry, nine and four, not going to not going to cut it. The Red Sox win that division. The Blue Jays plummet all the way back to fourth place in the division. Short the All-Stars that season, shortstop Tony Fernandez, an All-Star, center fielder Lloyd Mosby, an All-Star, right fielder Jesse Barfield, an All-Star. How cool is that? I mean, this close to having the entire outfield as All-Stars. And the only reason George Bell, who was, who was awesome in 1986, Bell in 86 hit 309, 31 home runs, 108 RBIs, fourth in MVP voting. <laughs> is that good? I mean, he had a monster season in 86. Couldn't crack at the time the all-star team because that was Kirby Puckett, Dave Winfield, and Ricky Henderson. <laughs> right? So not exactly some Johnny come lately. That was three superstars right there. Uh, Jesse Burford, you, you say fifth in, in – in, I, 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 as I say, they're fifth in MVP voting to Bell's fourth – how about the season Jesse Barfield had in 19, uh, 1986? Really want to get Jesse Barfield on the show. Uh, I've had the pleasure of interviewing, interviewing him before. Just a wonderful, wonderful guest. Jesse Barfield, 7.8 war in 1986. 40 home runs. Led the league. 40 home runs for Jesse in 1986. Tony Fernandez would lead the league with 163 games played that season. And you did hear me correctly. In a 162-game season, Tony Fernandez would play 163 games. Yeah, the rules were much different in those days. There was a game for the Blue Jays that finished at a tie after nine innings, or they replayed – oops, I'm just hitting my hat here. They replayed the entire game the next day. They replayed the entire game the next – I mean, that, that's how it was back in those days. Fernandez playing 163 games. It, it used to happen, actually, more often than you might think. Uh, Pete Rose twice played 163 games. One time as a 38-year-old. Heck, as a 38-year-old, Pete Rose played 163 one time. Uh, Brooks Robinson played uh, played 163 a few times. The most recent player to play 163 games. I, I like this hat on the side like this. No. Uh, uh, sorry if you're, if you're listening to this podcast. You don't know what I'm talking about right now, but uh, but I'll digress here. But the, the most recent player to play 163 games is some CanCon, some Canadian Canadian content that was back in 2008 it was justin morneau if you're interested it's a baseball podcast so maybe you are five players have played 164 games in a season and the all-time record was set back in 1962 that was maury wills who played 165 games now also going on franchise records popping in 1986 for the blue jays fernandez obviously 163 games franchise record he also had 687 at bats holy moly that's a franchise record and 161 singles 
How many players were going to 161 hits in a season? Fernandez had 161 singles as a franchise record. Uh, John Cerruti, rest in peace to John Cerruti. He had four wild pitches in one game. That, that was in 86. That's a franchise record. And really odd here. Follow me on this one because this is odd. The longest one nothing loss in Toronto Blue Jay franchise history was in 1986. It was late July. It was a 15-inning affair against the Oakland Athletics. And the longest one-inning game that the Blue Jays won in franchise history also ironically, 1986. That was a late September game against the Boston Red Sox. Blue Jays won in the 12th. And the last thing I want to touch on on 1986 is how epic Mark Icorn was. We were talking about Dan Quisenberry earlier from the Royals, that, that awesome sidearm reliever. You remember Mark Icorn? Awesome sidearm reliever for the Blue Jays. Now, he was a middle reliever. He set a franchise record that season. This is his rookie season, by the way. And he set a franchise record for Blue Jay relievers with 14 wins. 14 wins for middle reliever. My goodness, he had the most innings pitched in franchise history, set, set in 86, 157. Now, for some context, Adam Simber led Blue Jay relievers last season with 70 and two-thirds. So if you double that, you still don't get the 157 that Mark Eichhorn authored for the Blue Jays in 1986. Eichhorn would finish third in rookie of the year voting, middle reliever. Middle reliever finishing third in rookie of the year voting, and sixth in Cy Young voting, a rookie middle reliever finished sixth in Cy Young voting. That's how awesome, that's how special Mark Icorn was in 1986 for your Toronto Blue Jays. That's going to wrap up Wednesday's Locked on Blue Jay podcast. I know, I mean, we've been packed, right? So we haven't even had a chance to do trivia yet this week. Uh, come hell or high water, we're doing trivia tomorrow. Believe me, I'm bringing you trivia on Thursday, no matter what. I, I really enjoy doing that. Doing, doing trivia with you, and, and this week, of course, with the Blue Jays playing the White Sox, it'll have that Blue Jays and that White Sox twist to it. In fact, just for a show of good faith here, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll start with a teaser trivia question here, and, and, and I'm mentioning this because the answer is somebody that we mentioned in today's Locked on Blue Jay podcast episode. Locked on Blue Jays podcast, by the way, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And of course, tonight's Blue Jay game, like every 2023 Toronto Blue Jay game, available for you to catch on Sirius XM. Now, let me ask you this. Again, there's your clue. We mentioned this gentleman today. What Blue Jays closer had some rough moments in that series? In that series I'm talking about, in 1993, remember, it's Blue Jays and White Sox related, right? Well, in 93, that's how the Blue Jays got to the World Series, is they went through the Chicago White Sox in the American League Championship Series, four games to two. You may remember that. Pretty good series. Pretty good series, actually. The uh, the road team won the first four games. The Blue Jays went to Chicago and won, ga won games one and two, but then Chicago came to Toronto and, and won games three and four. My goodness. Okay. I think the, the road team all told might have, uh, I think, won five of those six games actually in that series. I mean, pretty interesting series. The Blue Jays closer at the time had rough moments, did get two saves in the series, which includes, now this wasn't a rough moment. This includes a five out save in the game clinching game six. Who was that reliever? Now, as far as the rest of today, keep it locked on the Locked On Podcast Network and check out Sully hosting Locked On MLB. Enjoy the game tonight. Serious, right? Serious XM, yes, indeed. Enjoy the game tonight. Go Jays, go. And we'll talk tomorrow.